I did read this little story that was really a very, very, uh, very touching story. Matter of fact, it always draw a tear to my eye. Uh, one day, Hercules, Snow White, and Quasimodo, you know Quasimodo, the back another day, were standing around talking, and Hercules spoke up and said, I bet I'm the strongest man in the world. Snow White, they looked around and said, well, I bet that I'm the most beautiful person in the world. Then Quasimodo looked around and quietly said, I suppose that I'm the ugliest man in the world. An old man had been listening to their conversation and said there's a psychic at the top of the hill up there. Uh, why don't you go, each of you go up there and ask for yourself. So the three friends agreed and they hiked to the top of the hill. Hercules went in first and came out a few minutes later and said, I was right. I am the strongest man in the world. Snow White went in next. She came out a few minutes later and she said, I was also right. I'm the most beautiful person in the world. Finally, it was Quasimodo's turn. He went in, and after a few minutes, he came out scratching his head. He looks up at his friends and said, Who is Frank Richards? <laughs> My wife said, Do not pick on Frank. I said, He picks on me mercifully. Mercifully. I said, you need to go to prison with him. Sometimes I want to shut the door on my head. I said, every chance I get to go back, I'm going to get my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. something we're going to start another another little series i'm trying to get to, to throw the book at him and, and every time i try it seems like uh, uh other things just keep keep uh, not not floundering but flooding my mind and when i say flooding uh if you've ever had to step up before people I know you have step up before people and and bring something a message and you know uh i remember when i had a fellowship with uh in bath with uh uh, church of Christ and uh, the Christian Church and the Methodist Church and the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal pastor he preached six services a day, and he had to drive all over the place to preach these services. And the, uh, some of the other guys they were doing the same thing. And, and I said, I don't know how y'all do that. And they said, We don't know how you do what you do. And I said, well, What are you talking about? I said, I don't preach six services on Sunday. They said, Yeah, but you preach three separate on a week, and nobody tells you what to preach like we get told. And I said, oh. I said, well, I get cold. I get told, too. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I get told by the, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm sitting here, and I'm uh, working on through the book end, through the book end, through the book end. And uh, it was just amazing. This just keeps coming to my mind. I can't get it out of my mind. And so I reckon that's the Lord telling us that we need to, we need to check this out. So turn to the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Chapter 17, stand for the reading of the word. 1 Samuel 17. God is good. 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. You got your Bible, say amen. If you don't say on me. <laughs> There should be a Bible in front of you or behind you if you look uh, on the pew. Also, if you got it found, it say Amen. If you don't, say Wait. <laughs> okay, here you go. Ready? And David said to Saul, verse thirty-two, that no man's heart fail of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You got to understand, David's David's around five foot five. They they actually. Uh, 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 I, I'm going to say the fancy word for it. They dug him up. And they found out that he was only, he was in his, he was only like 5 foot 6, 5 foot 7 at the most. So he's 17 years old. So he's like 5 foot 5. Depending on what cubic you use, Goliath is between 9 and a half and 11 and a half foot tall. So, so he doubles the size of David. And Saul so said to David, Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. 
And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he had rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. It must have been very convincing for Saul to tell him to go. And Saul armed David with his armor and put on his helmet of brass upon his head. He also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. And he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with stays? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I have come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with a sword and spear, but for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass that when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took, took thus a stone and slanged it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head thereof. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Just for the hands of sway, ask God for a special touch and anointing. Father, it truly is an honor to be in your house. And it truly is an honor to minister to, this, to you, the audience of one. Help us all realize that and know that as we all look up to you today and know that we're here, Lord, to worship you. And Lord, knowing that God, in turn, you will do something for us that we cannot do on our own. The only thing we can do is worship, and then you do the rest. I ask you to give us that strength and that anointing. Lord, touch us, God, in such a way that we know that you've been here, that you've worked with us and through us, God, and that you have got this. Lord, we trust you right now. In the name of Jesus, for some miraculous things to happen this day. And that when we leave this place, something miraculous will have taken place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 You can be seated. I want to talk for just a few minutes on five lessons from five smooth stones. Five lessons from five smooth stones. And of course, uh, when we talk about David and Goliath, we always talk about David and Goliath from David's viewpoint. But today we're going to talk about, again, I, and I've talked about this a subject similar before. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about it today from Goliath's viewpoint. Now think about it. We're not, talking about, we're not talking about how David saw this. We're going to talk about how Goliath saw this. So get ready. There's some good stuff in here, and I want you to really dig down deep. And again, anytime, remember this, anytime you want an outline from the service, you can get it. Just wait, I'll go make a copy. Anytime you have any questions about it, write it down. I'll be glad to talk with you about it because we want you to learn as much as you possibly can and to be able to fight the battle the best you possibly can. So five lessons from five smooth stones. Again, we're going to talk about this from Goliath's viewpoint. Now that's kind of, that's kind of, has anybody felt like that lately? You're looking at your problem and you see your problem overwhelming. That's, that's an overwhelming problem. It's a giant in your life. Matter of fact, there's a lot of us in there right now. We have overwhelming giants in our life. And when this overwhelming giant comes against us, we have a choice. 
We can run and crouch in fear. We can deny, uh, or we can go ahead and take the, take the bull by the horse, so to speak, and fight the battle. So, so, so here, here we're going to talk about uh, 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 five lessons from five spoon stones. First, that there's Goliath. Now, now Goliath, uh, <clears throat> to him, it's another day at office. If you look at Goliath, there was Goliath and his four brothers. That's really a lot of people say it's prophetic that he had five smooth stones. He used one for Goliath. And then by the hands of David and of his servants, the four other brothers of Goliath died. So there was five, five all together that died. And every last one of them, if you look at them, their names, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it's a, it's a method of spiritual warfare that, that the enemy comes against us with. But number one thing that the enemy does to get us, number one thing the enemy does to tear us up is... Goliath means beheader. The very first thing Satan has to do, if he's going to win the battle against you, if he's going to take you down, the very first thing the enemy has to do is he has to behead you. He has to get you thinking in the wrong direction. As a man thinketh, so he is. He tries to get you thinking in the wrong direction, thinking nobody loves you, everybody hates you. Uh, one person can say something and ruin your whole day because he's got you doing some stinking thinking. So the very first thing the enemy has to do in our life, if he's going to win, is he's got to behead us. Now next, thing, there's the champion. Goliath went out for 40 days and 40 nights. So that's 80 trips. Now think about now, he's bombarding the children of Israel in the morning. The first thing they hear when they wake up is Goliath. The last thing they hear when they go to bed is Goliath. I'm here to tell you right now, if the enemy is trying to behead you, the first thing you hear in the morning is that stuff that he's trying to get you to believe, that junk that he's trying to get you to believe. And the last thing you'll hear at night before you go to bed, you will go to bed thinking about the junk that he's trying to get you to believe. So, all the children of Israel, the armies of Israel, they're all hiding behind rocks. Saul, who is the biggest, the baddest of them all, is hiding. And Goliath comes out and says, look, we all need one man, the champion, to come and fight me. And what it was back in that day, because it was such a bloody confrontation. Remember the Civil War? And how many thousands of men died in each battle? Because after you got your shot off, then you had to go hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was some Terrible, terrible stuff. And a lot of people, a lot of amputees, a lot of bad stuff happened in those battles. Can you imagine back in the earlier days when you didn't even have uh, uh, the gun with you? And so these guys, it would be a very, very tragic thing. And so what they would do is they would call for the champion. And in the middle of the field, the champion from the one side would fight, face the champion from the other side. And it was win or take all. Whoever won, the other side had to submit to the winning side and they had to turn over their arms and give over the spoil and offer themselves as slaves to the other side. And so there's this, and so nobody wants to take this opportunity to be the champion of Israel. I don't know if anybody just didn't feel like they were up to it. I don't know exactly what was going on other than they were scared out of their wits because the beheader had them believing they were not able. The beheader today has got some of y'all thinking you can't get over the problem that you're facing. You can't stand up against the problem that you're facing. And he tells you that when you get up in the morning, oh, here's another day that you're going to have to face this problem. When you go to bed at night, here's another day. When you get up in the morning, you're going to have to face it again. And so you toss and turn all night. So, so, so here it is. The champion, the gap stander was there. So never, remember that. So, so, so the challenger, Goliath, had for 40 days or 40 nights, he'd been coming out then. He beheaded Israel without a fight. How many times has Satan beheaded you without a fight? How many times has he played that hit game with you and won without ever lifting a finger? Wow. That's powerful. And so, 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 so remember, this, 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 here he is. He had beheaded Israel without a fight. Now, now this is what's so cool. Ed, see, he's over here looking at all these big old soldiers and all these big bad to the bone guys, and they don't want to fight him, but now he's getting ready to meet a little shepherd boy. A little shepherd boy that just didn't know that he could be beat. He trusted his God enough to know that his God could handle it. He was set out in the fields and, and write love songs to God. As he wrote love songs to God, we got him now 
called the Psalms. So he writes love songs to God and he talks about his experiences in the song. And you'll see even if the song starts out bad, it ends up good because he tells about how God took the bad situation and he turned it around. So now, so now, Goliath's perspective about the whole thing is getting ready to change. We're only going to do one of them today. we got five stones, but I don't, I, I, look, look, I, I don't want to behead you today with five of them. <laughs> right. One. We'll do, we'll do one or two, three, four next week, all right? So now, now watch this now. There, 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 there's five things. There are five things that Goliath did that brought uh, him to feet. Five of them. And, and I want you to think about this. I want you to see this because he still uses them today. But what he does is, as he's using them, he beheads you and gets you into thinking what he's trying to tell you is true. Get ready. What he's trying to get you to believe, he wants you to believe that is true. And so we must never allow this stuff to take root in our life. We must never allow it. I was at the, the cancer center the day, and, and one of the ladies was in there and said, and when you're at the cancer center, you get to see a bunch of people, of course, with cancer, and they're all going through different stages and, and, and going through different things, and some in wheelchairs and some on crutches, and some are walking, but they're all going through different stages of cancer. And, and, and uh, uh, something happened, I don't know exactly what happened, but the lady, I, I saw the lady, I saw it. I could see it, I could sense it. The devil just come up to her. Goliath went up with his sword in, 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 in my mind. I'm not talking about I saw it literally. I saw it in my mind. But as she began to talk, I saw it. I saw the enemy behead her. And then he come to me and Bethany and drew his sword to get us to believe the same And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, don't believe that lie. Don't even, don't even play with it in your mind. I said, matter of fact, she said, but I can't stop the thought. And then I told her this one, of course, you all heard this before. I said, you can't stop a bird from landing on your head, but you can keep it from building a nest. And she said, that's a good point. I said, then pick your head back up and get back in the game. How many times somebody told you to get your head back in the game? That's what I was talking about. Don't lose your head. Amen. So, so, so here we go. Watch this now. Here it goes. If you know this stuff's coming, then you're already prepared for it. If you know you're already coming, you're prepared for it, then it shouldn't take you, shouldn't get the best of you like it would have if you were not prepared for it. All right? So here we go. Number one. I look at the little David. When he purdy. The Bible says he was purdy and he was red-headed and freckled face. I think his name was David Richards, was it? <laughs> no, no, it was David. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. That's amazing how Quasi Mother we talked about Frank and now we're talking about Brandon. How did he even come from the same family? I don't know. Here we go. <laughs> oh, I know we're joking. Amen. So, in verse 42, it says, He disdained him, for he was only a youth. He, Goliath, listen carefully, because he gets you to believe this. He judged the outcome by the size of his opponent. Of course, Goliath overrun David. He was twice his size. And so he said, this is going to be easy. This is going to be powerful. I mean, I only have to, I can just flick him and he'll go. But many times we see the enemy and we see the size of the enemy and we're afraid. The things have been coming at us so long, 40 days and 40 nights. And for the number of trial. Here it is. You have had this trial coming and hits you in the morning when you wake up and hits you before you go to bed at night. You sleep on it. You know, uh, uh, I wish I could find it now. I, uh, I was sitting there the other night. It was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. All of a sudden, a friend out of nowhere just sends me a text. And it says, why don't you just give this to God and get you a good night's sleep? End of story. Whoa. And so I texted him back and I said, who'd you send that to? And then God tell you to send it. He said, well, I reckon God told me to send it, so you're the only person I sent it to. I said, well, I reckon God did tell you to send it, and, and you tell God thank you for me. So watch this. Here we go. You ready? Goliath was insulted. There was 
a voice sent to do a man's job. Goliath was a mighty warrior. He was trained from, from the early days up. He had no emotions when he went into battle. He just won. He didn't care what he had to do, what he had to, what he had, who he had to kill. He was emotionally trained to be, to just be a wall and to go in and to take it down. And here comes this little ruddy, red-headed face coming up against his body warrior. And so when he sees this, first he's insulted. Then after he's insulted, he begins to laugh and he begins to mock. So see, again, remember now, see, 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 I'm here to say something that some of y'all need to hear bad. Listen carefully. He had already determined the winner. Some of y'all in here right now have already determined the loser. And it's not your enemy. Without a fight, without raising a sword, you see the size of the enemy that's coming against you. And you already have determined that it's going to be a quick victory. It's going to be easy for the enemy to come against you. And so instead of standing up and fighting, instead of resisting, you just already determined that you're going to lose. And I can tell you, if that's what you got in your mind, then I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I can promise you, if that's what's in your mind, guess what you're going to do? You're going to lose. We cannot fall for the tactics of the beheader. Amen? So watch this. That's who it look. Satan himself. Of course, that's who Goliath was standing for. That's who Goliath was a symbol of. Satan himself works at us through intimidation. I'm going to give you a few scriptures. I want you to take your scriptures. And I want you to hold on to them. What I do is when I find myself in a situation where I seem outnumbered. When I find myself in a situation like a Beth in the cancer. And I, I have to not give in to the intimidation. Not give in. You know when I look at the doctor and the doctor goes. I'm not. You know all of a sudden you hear in your mind. He's giving you to tell me there's nothing else. Because he's going. And I have to stop myself. And I said, no, they didn't talk. Or, or when something's going on in somebody else's life and I'm trying to help them and all of a sudden the doctor comes in and says, well, I got good news and bad news or I just got some bad news or whatever. You know, oh. And, and back in the day, before they changed the emergency room around in the Beaufort County Hospital, there was a certain room that the doctor came out or the nurse came out and said, the doctor, we'll see you in this room. If it was in that room and I'd been a chaplain there, I knew what that meant. That the loved one had died and now he was in there or was dying and he wouldn't take him in that room to talk to them and I'd have to go in and console them. And so I remember when that was sitting there and, and, and the wife even told me, she says, I wonder how my husband's doing. I said, I don't know. And she says, where'd the doctor come from? He went, where'd the doctor go? He was right over there. I said, well, as long as he stays up, I felt so bad after this. I said, as long as he stays over there, we're fine. If he calls you from that room, watch out. The door opened and said, ma'am, can you come in here? And I well, just want to say it. They said, your husband's leaving this world. If you want to speak to him, speak to him now. Hold his hand. But I thought about how many times do we already have it set up in our mind? If it happens this way, we're not going to win. If it happens this way, we're going to lose. If it happens this way, we got to get that thinking out of our mind. The stinking thinking will take us out of here quicker than anything else. It will rush through pipes. So number one, I sit down sometimes at night when I'm trying to lay down and I can't sleep. Here's what I do. I start quoting these scriptures. I don't just quote the scripture. I actually try to imagine. It's called meditation. I try to think about the scripture and I think about every word, every phrase. And when I think about these words and these phrases, as I begin to think about them in my mind, these words and phrases, then I begin to imagine Jesus sitting there right with me telling me this. And as I just keep going over with it in my mind, it's amazing how much comfort you can feel. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Stay from anything that's going to take away your ability to think. The beheader. Very first thing. Leave the beheader alone. Understand that he wants to take away your ability to think. He wants to control your thinking and get you to think what he wants you to think 
And I can guarantee you it's not going to be good. So, be sober. Be vigilant. Don't just, don't just push it down. Sometimes you've got to keep pushing it down. You've got to keep resisting. You've got to keep saying, I'm not going to listen. You've got to keep saying, I'm not going to put up with this. You're not going to tear my mind apart. You're not going to get me where I cannot think. You're not. Be sober. A stay from there which takes away your mind to be header. Be vigilant. Sometimes you have to keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. And remember I told you, the negative in your mind, a negative outweighs a positive by six to seven times. And so you have to control a negative with a bunch of positives in order to get that negative down. So you got to keep on going. I'm not going to put up with it. I don't have to listen to this. I'm not going to fall for you again now for your junk. So be sober and vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, the adversary, the one that is totally against you, even if you think he tries to tell you that he's for you, as long as he can do something even greater against you, he is not for you. He's your adversary. He's like the mighty wind that's blowing against you. So, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's on the prowl. He's on the prowl. If you'll let him, he'll come in your house. If you'll let him, he'll, he'll just go on into your mind and start talking. And he's in there telling you how you're not going to get this, how you're not going to make it, just like the serpent did Eve in the garden. Does God really love you? I really mean it when he said you couldn't eat everything in this garden, but this one fruit. Is God, is God scared that you're going to be like him, that you can notice stuff? Here it is. The lion is on the prowl. I love this. This is my, one of my favorite scriptures in, in the entire Bible. Matter of fact, I had a cockatoo, a cockatiel. Cockatiel is a little. I had a cockatiel, and I'm going to tell you, I saw the scripture, and I decided to teach him something. I'll tell you in a minute. In nothing be terrified by your adversaries. In nothing. What does nothing mean? In nothing. It means no matter what he throws at you, no matter what he throws at you. Don't be afraid of him. Don't be terrified. Don't look at this, Hey, I can understand if you're, if you're startled. I mean, as I'm saying times, I've been startled, but there's a difference between startled and terrified. Terrified is when I'm stuck in my tracks and I can't move. I can be startled and keep moving, but I, if I'm terrified, I can't do a thing. I'm just stuck. I can't do a thing. So look, in nothing be terrified or stuck by your adversaries. Or when he comes against you and he's attacking against you. Which, is, which to your adversaries, to them is an evident token means that you can't, you can't, you cannot deny this. It's an evident token of their perdition, of their evil, but to you of salvation and that of God. And I told you about my cockatoo, my cockatiel. I told my cockatiel I was teaching it things. It was saying things. You know, I, my favorite was get me out of here. I told it how to say get me out of here. So people come in the house and, <laughs> and my cockatiel will be sitting in his cage going, get me out of here, get me out of here. Of course, praise God. I love to praise God. Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. But my favorite, my favorite. I couldn't teach him all of this. I couldn't teach him the whole scripture because he didn't have any bigger vocabulary. I couldn't even teach him Philippians 1.28. Here's what I taught him. He'd be sitting in the cage and go, Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And people say, is he saying, Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. I said, yes. Don't he realize he's a bird? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, <laughs> people said, well, why is he saying here, kitty, kitty, kitty? I said, because well, I told him in Philippians 1, 28, and nothing be terrified by your adversaries. <laughs> I said, I want my bird to be strong. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and nothing be terrified of your adversaries. And watch this. Here, here, here's a good one. I had to come over this. I had to overcome this one big time. When I first started preaching, I was so I looked like a little bitty young. I was almost 30. I looked like I was 15. And somebody even asked me was on the work program from school to preach. I was so skinny. I looked like a mop. Big old hair. Big old big hair. I bought a pinstripe suit. I was so skinny. I only had one stripe. I had to run back and forth shower to get wet. I had to tease the hair on my legs to hold my socks up. I mean, I was skinny. And I always tell somebody, go, I go into a prison, or I go into the jail ministry, and somebody goes, well, who are you? Are you here to clean up our mess? Are you here to do this? Are you here to, we're going to change your diaper? 
And so I still miss them a lot. I mean a lot. Timothy was a young man, probably one of the youngest ones in the ministry. Timothy had a great responsibility. He was going to be taken over after Paul left. So Paul was doing his best to teach Timothy how to be an overseer. How to be able to handle the, all these churches and handle all this stuff. And people would talk about Timothy because he was so young looking and because he just was like a kid. And they didn't think he knew anything. And so Paul had to keep telling Timothy, you got this. God's got this with you. But I love this one. Let no man despise thy youth. Don't let somebody judge you because they think you're too young, too old. Not good enough, not big enough, not small enough. Whatever you are, the devil's going to tell you, whatever you are, he's going to tell you the other end of the spectrum is what people are looking for. You're not old enough. You're not young enough. You're not big enough. You're not smart enough. Guess what? You're everything God needs you to be. Amen? So now, let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example to the believer. In other words, you make sure, no matter what, you be an example. Show them you may be a little, but dynamite comes in small packages. Amen? So, and I, and I was watching this movie, that I don't know if it was a show, and it was talking about weapons. And it talked about the atom bomb and how it was developed and all this, and then how finally it was used in World War II. And, and I saw that, that tiny atom, and that, that tiny atom, I forget how many people, once that, once that one bomb was dropped, I forget if it was... If it was, I can't remember enough if it was 80 or 800. I can't remember which, but it was either 80,000 or 800,000 uh, were killed by that one bomb in a matter of seconds. Many people didn't even know what hit them. When they went there to clean up afterwards, there was buildings that had the shadow of people on the building, but the people were gone. They were burned up that fast. They were vaporized. And when the blast came by, their shadow was on the wall, and they were nowhere to be found. A tiny, tiny atom. And then, the rattlesnake, of course. The rattlesnake, a, dead, a baby one can be just as deadly as a large one. And one of my favorite stories of all times is Gideon and his 300. He, 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 he overthrew the Midianites, and of course Elijah... And his, ser his servant, they took on the entire Syrian army. You see, like I told Bethany, I was telling Bethany this morning, I was telling her yesterday, and, and I just keep, keep trying to keep telling her and telling her, keep trying to lift up her faith and, and keep her moving forward, not backwards, and keep on holding on and believing, not, not disbelieving, but believing God for a miracle and believing God can do something. And, and, and of course, I... I, I when I take, I'll take a picture of her wound and then I'll take it and I'll hold it up to her and I'll say, now, do you see a difference? She says, yes, Daddy, it's getting smaller. I said, don't you see that? And then when I try to abandon her or whatever, she'll say, it hurt me, Daddy. I said, I can't help it. I've got to hurt you. But this hurting is a healing hurt. Don't keep thinking about the negative. You keep thinking about the positive, girl. You're going to get through this. You're going to stand strong. She says, yes, Daddy, we're going to do it. I said, yes, we're going to do it together. All right? But look, again, mustard seed faith. Anybody ever seen a mustard seed? That's a man's look. It's about the size of take your pen. If you got a pen with you, take your pen and, 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 and pop out the end. That's about how big that little ball on the end. That's about how big a mustard seed faith, a mustard seed is. Very, 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 very small. It's, but God said the smallest of seeds can produce the most powerful <coughs> results. Think about it. The smallest of seeds can produce the most powerful results. Results. You just keep on sowing seeds. Don't you let the beheader get you thinking that what you do doesn't matter. That what you say doesn't matter. That you have nothing to say. That you have nothing to do. Don't let the enemy get you to believe that. Or that you cannot get out of this. Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for very I say to you, if you have a faith as a grain of mustard seed, and I can see him holding it up, you can point him. You can say, this mountain, remove him forth to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing, y'all say nothing. nothing. And nothing shall be impossible for you. So, and I'm getting ready to close. He said he was a youth and 
everybody in Fair County. So let me ask you a question. I love Zechariah 4 and 10. Who has, desired, who has despised the day of small things? I like uh, another translation is, who has despised the day of small beginnings? Goliath did. And Goliath died. Wow. Goliath despised David. But David showed him just what his God was made out of. You see, all of Israel compared God to Goliath. And David come along and compared Goliath to his God. Wow. There's a big difference. It's only one of the stones. We're going to have to hit the rest of them, or maybe all of them next week. Pretty sure. If we don't, we'll get them in two weeks. You can look around you. You can sit back and, and, and it's easy to look around you and go, you know what? I remember when this place was packed and, and whatever. And or sit back and I remember when such and such was going on, when we had this going on, that going on. And, and we don't realize and we kind of forget that, look, again, we get that stinking thinking we're beheaded. And thinking this is how it's always going to be and it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. Well, you know what? I'm pretty sure it's what Gideon was thinking. As God started moving stuff out of the way so he could do a fresh work. I don't see negative. I see positive. God's getting ready just to build us back up in a very powerful way. But we've got to trust him along the way. You know, my wife and I went and bought a flower. It was really funny. Uh... Linda went and she said, I just want a little flower to go, a little green flower to put in the bedroom. I said, okay. And she, this was Friday night at Lowe's, and she said, I don't even care. She says, we're so good at killing them. <laughs> <laughs> That's our gift. <laughs> we have a black thumb. She said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, we looked over there. She said, I don't want to spend a lot of money on this one little bitty one. So we go over there and we look. And this said, <laughs> this count section, plants. So we're going to pick up, I should have put the pictures up here. I'm going to try to put one up here for us next week. And there was a pot that was about that big around, about like this, and it had <laughs> dried up flowers laying over the side. Or leaves, just leaves just laid over. And she said, look here, honey. I said, why? Is it ready for I said, if it takes some fat back, we can have us a little meal. <laughs> Cook it. She said, no. She says, I believe something can happen from that. And I said, dear, that thing is graveyard dead. She says, no, nah, there's still a chance. I said, she said, it's only a dollar. I said, it's a dollar too much. They need to pay you a dollar to take it. <laughs> and she says, no, honey, I believe that'll grow. I said, all right, if you want to. So I get it. I said, let me see if I can't talk them out of the checkout line. Talk them down. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the checkout line. I said, you're really going to charge us a dollar for this? And she said, uh-huh. I said, it's dead. I said, you ought to pay us a dollar to take it. She says, no, you're going to pay me a dollar to take it. I said, but look, lady, can't you let knock something off? She said, about to tell you what I can do. I said, what? She goes over to the, it was outside the back. She goes over to the water hose and she squirts it. She goes, and she was from, she was, she was from some other nationality. And she said, now when you go home, it'll be nice and pretty. <laughs> And I said, really? <laughs> I said, it's dead. I said, I'm going to name it. If this comes up, I'm going to name this Lazarus. <laughs> <laughs> and so to make matters worse, she put it in a Lowe's bag. And I walked out and started going, dun, 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 And I carried it home and we stuck it <laughs> beside it in this chair. The next morning, it was up and pretty. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know what? That was the best dollar we ever spent on a plant. <laughs> and she said, I think we're going to call this plant Lazarus. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, there's a lot of areas that you deal with with other people and your own self that you feel like everything's kind of just laid down and wilted. 
But if you trust me with it and just keep adding the water of life, you can see the same thing happen. Some of y'all right now, God's waiting. He wants to raise it up, but you got to change your thinking. Amen. That's all standing. <laughs> Brandon, you want to come play something kind of softly?
Tuesday night we're talking about decision making and discovering God's will for your life. Come on out. We're having an awesome, awesome, awesome time. Everybody's heart and mind clear? You ready, ready to go home and make a difference for the Lord? Yeah. Look at somebody and tell them God make a difference. <laughs> All right. All right. Hang in there. Brother Dudley, dismiss your prayer, please. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you.